Welcome to Citizen Science, stories of science we can do together, brought to you by SciStarter. In this episode, health and medicine projects to keep you and your community healthy. Well, it's flu season and also respiratory syncytial virus or RSV season, probably COVID season too. So what better time than now to look at citizen science projects that can help prevent disease? Now, you might recall a couple of years ago, we featured a mobile app called COVID Near You. It was developed at Boston Children's Hospital and was based on an existing app called Flu Near You. In both cases, you signed up and every week you get an email or text message asking how you were feeling, healthy or sick. If you replied healthy, it just replied, great to hear you're feeling well. And if you answered sick though, you'd get a few more questions about your symptoms. The apps were invaluable to researchers and public health officials, giving them a heads up on the location of possible disease outbreaks. Now, the apps have been combined into a single app called Outbreaks Near Me. It's designed to track all respiratory infectious diseases. And we have with us Autumn Gertz. She's Senior Project Manager for Digital Health at Boston Children's Hospital and manages Outbreaks Near Me. Hey Autumn, thanks for joining us. Hello, thank you for having me. All right, can you um, uh, bring us up to date on outbreaks near me? I'm, I'm a little behind uh, because there's flu near you, there's outbreaks near me. I think there was another one too. And, and um, so what's happening now? <laughs> yeah, so right now in its current form, uh, we are outbreaks near me. Uh -huh. uh, this was previously flu near you, um, which a lot of folks were familiar with. And then in March of 2020, we launched COVID Near You to sort of account right. for the COVID-19 pandemic, which was emerging at that time. Yeah. Uh, very quickly realized two sites doing the same thing wasn't the most efficient or easy for our participants and volunteers. So we combined those in December 2020 mm -hmm. to Outbreaks Near Me, which is what it currently is. And that captures flu, COVID-19, RSV, uh, really tuned to respiratory illness, but we do collect a wide variety of symptoms mm -hmm, uh, and hope mm -hmm. to look at other diseases as well. Wow, and you know, it's so important to have information on these illnesses, um, you know, so maybe you can stop them before they spread. Um, now, I'm already a member. Uh, could you tell our listeners and viewers how they can join? Yeah, so there's a couple ways. Um, the easiest way is to go to our website, www.outbreaksnearme.org, and submit a report. Uh, from there, you can tell us if you're feeling healthy or sick. Uh, we'll ask you questions about your vaccination status, some demographic information. If you aren't feeling well, first of all, we're sorry to hear that. Um, but second of all, we'll ask sort of what symptoms you're experiencing. Did you seek care? Did you get treatment? Uh, and if you like participating and want to continue, uh, you can sign up for an account. So you'll enter your email address and then we'll send you a reminder every week to report, um, which is easy that you don't have to remember. You can submit from there. Um, you'll also get things like our newsletters that go out about quarterly, some updates on what's going on with COVID and flu and other things. Um, but really going to the website and just telling us how you feel is your, your easiest way to participate. It's very, very easy. Yes. Uh, now, what do you do with this information? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, how, how is it being used uh, for research? There's a variety of different ways. So our team, the Computational Epidemiology Lab, we have our own research. So we'll do research on these trends. Uh, we had a paper come out um, in an MMWR, or Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, um, last year, two years ago, that was looking at the uptake in at-home testing of COVID-19 and how that sort of impacts um, the surveillance and estimates of how much COVID is actually circulating. Mm -hmm. um, so we have our own research there. And then there's other academic groups that use the research um, for their own purposes, uh, for, or use, excuse me, the data for research, looking at flu burden, COVID burden, other things, uh, sort of in whatever their area of interest is. Mm -hmm. Next are state and local health department partners. So we have a variety of state and local health departments that use our data to complement their flu and COVID surveillance that they need to do for their municipalities. Our data will help them sort of fill in the holes of, well, who might be experiencing COVID but isn't getting detected because they're not seeking care, they're not going to a doctor, their case isn't being picked up elsewhere. Um, and then on the national level, uh, the Center for Disease Control uses our data um, quite a bit to help with their flu, to, flu burden estimates 
um, and then as well as COVID-19. And uh, even during the pandemic, our data got as high as, as the White House um, at times. So. Uh huh. I would imagine that the users of Outbreaks Near Me, I, I think it's probably skewed to a certain percentage of the population and that you're missing a lot of people that either don't trust uh, the government or don't trust institutions, they don't want to share information. Is there a way to to reach you know a broader range of the American public? Yeah, that's a great question. So we're, our population does skew. It skews older, mm -hmm. uh, more female, more white, and more health conscious than the U.S. population. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that's sort of seen across citizen science. Yeah. It's seen across health-related um, participatory projects specifically. Uh, we actually have some targeted recruitment efforts ongoing to make our sample more representative if we, you know, we don't look like the U.S., what we're telling you is happening might not look like what's actually right. happening in the country as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so we have some, you know, work targeted ads, uh, outreach, that kind of thing. I think broadly, something that we've actually found to be pretty successful is empowering folks like this is this can be an empowering tool for your health and your family's health if you report in how you're feeling if you're seeing the data back to you oh there's high rates in my area um, you know we work very closely with state and federal government but we're not um, sort of within the bureaucracy they're in like these are real people reporting how they're feeling and it's real people experiencing this illness mm -hmm. so if someone is weary of the data coming out of cdc or from their state health department we're independent of that. We're really just people reporting how they're feeling and that can sort of give you the knowledge you need to make decisions about your health and your household's health. So you can get information back. Uh, so you put in your information, you know, whether it's text or whatever, mm -hmm. how do you find out what's going on in your yeah. area and what, you, and what you're learning? So on our homepage, first and foremost, there's a map that shows the past three weeks. It shows, um, you can do a different toggles and, and filters on it and overlays, but it'll show uh, folks experiencing COVID-like illness, folks experiencing flu-like illness, uh, folks not feeling well but not meeting either of those definitions, folks that feel healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can also do the official COVID-19 case counts by county and the flu official okay. case counts by state underneath to see sort of how that data is aligning. Um, you know, if you zoom really into a specific area, uh, the data might not be as granular as you would like it to be, but it does give a very good sense, especially on the state level, mm -hmm. about what's happening. Um, we also recently relaunched our flu trends page, which you can find on the report section of Outbreaks Near Me. And this shows um, with about a week or two lag, what we're seeing in our data with ILI, um, directly mapped with what the CDC ILI net is detecting at that time. So. Uh -huh. Oh, is that what ILI is? Influenza-like yes, illness? Yes, influenza-like oh, okay. illness. Sorry, no, good. no, okay. thank you. I say it all the time, so I never think of it. Yeah, influenza-like <laughs> illness is ILI. Okay. COVID-like illness is CLI. Um, okay. And that flu trends page, it shows you very close to near real time, um, our data, their data. You can see how well they align or don't, and then you can see sort of what's going on, if there's an uptick or not. Okay. Well, great. Thanks so much for sharing with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I encourage everyone to go report how you're feeling, especially as we head into flu season. Um, mm -hmm. It's good to check in, see how you're doing. You can report on your health or your household. And then it's also good to see sort of what's going on in your community. Great, great advice. All right, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Most of us have been affected by cancer. It causes 10 million deaths worldwide each year. In the U.S. last year, there were 2 million cases and over 600,000 deaths, making it the second leading cause of mortality behind heart disease. And for every patient, there are many caregivers, family members, friends, and community helpers. Our next guest is Belinda King Calamanis, and she's Senior Director of Patient Focused Research at Longevity, a nonprofit working to help lung cancer patients, their families, and other helpers. Hi, Belinda. Good to talk to you. Hi, Bob. Thanks for having me. So longevity was just added to SciStarter, so um, I don't know that much about it yet. I know you're working on lung cancer awareness and research, but uh, what more can you tell me about it? Uh, yeah, I can tell you a lot more, but I'll keep it <laughs> short. <laughs> um, longevity is indeed, uh, we focus on lung cancer. We're a lung cancer nonprofit. And we're interested, interested in changing outcomes for people living with lung cancer through research, education, and support. 
and that means that we have support services, so online support groups, education sessions, education materials. We have a policy group that works on policy issues and we fund um, translational research for new investigators, but we also do our own in-house research as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's interesting because I know certainly when I was growing up, lung cancer was, you know, I, I'm not sure, but perhaps the leading cause of uh, cancer deaths. And um, it seems that with the reduction in smoking and um, some air pollution measures and things, it seems to have gotten better. Is that just a perception or, or what is the situation now? Lung cancer still is the number one killer for lung cancer, for, for cancer deaths. Oh my gosh. Um, but there have been improvements with the treatment landscape, particularly, particularly over the last 10 years. Um, we've seen a lot of targeted therapies come to market to um, target specific uh, genes within the cancer uh -huh. um, that make it treatment options better for people who have those particular subtypes of lung cancer. So lung cancer is broken into a number of different subtypes these days. And are you involved in um, increasing public awareness? So people um, you know, might get tested earlier, you might get diagnosed earlier, and, and they'd be better able to take advantage of some of these new um, treatments and technologies? Yeah, so we do have a uh, screening awareness. Um, so for those people who are eligible, you can be screened uh, through low dose CT scans. So it's not too invasive. Um, at the moment in the US, most of the folks who are eligible for that do have to have had a tobacco history. Um, and so if you are somebody who has uh, smoked cigarettes in your, currently or in the past, you should definitely talk to your doctor about getting a low dose CT scan. Um, and seeing if you meet the specific criteria because it's not as invasive as some of the other uh, cancer screenings that are available. It's it, You just go in the machine and have a look. So we're working also to increase screening rates and we're also exploring more uh, some of the other exposures that we know occur and result often in lung cancer like radon, um, asbestos, silica, some of these um, workplace exposures that uh, things people might run into. Right, yeah, radon, that's one that um, sort of spiked in, a lot of people were, um, uh, there was a lot of awareness of that for a while and it seems to have dropped a little bit, but that's still a big concern, right? It is, it is, and a lot of people have no idea and it's a lifetime accumulation and it depends on your type of housing and the location of that housing as to whether you're exposed to it and it comes up from the earth so it's not something yeah. you can easily avoid um, but know it you can look up maps they're readily available to see if there is a high concentration of radium in your area okay now um, could you explain a little bit about the citizen science portion of longevity what what uh, that um, takes into account and how that works yeah, absolutely. So we have a, a patient-focused research center that's dedicated to research with patients and caregivers, because let's be honest, they're also integral to this, um, you know, how we think about people living with lung cancer. And so we have um, different projects, but our biggest one is an online survey that is running for one year where we are looking for caregivers and patients to complete this online survey so we can learn about, as we were just talking about exposures, we do ask questions about whether people know of any exposures they've had, also about specific oncogenes and the, how that was actually found out. Did they have biomarker testing and how long did it take to get some of those results back? And so we have this project that's going on and it's up on SciStarter um, and people can get involved that way and it's, the base the first survey takes a little bit of time to complete. It's about 45 minutes because we ask a lot of questions about your background and different, um, how you got diagnosed, whether you have family history of uh, lung cancer and other cancers as well. Um, and then the we have a monthly check-in to see if there's been any treatment changes, but also to see how side effects are kind of going as well and symptoms. Mm -hmm. Okay, now for our listeners and viewers, um, could you describe who you're looking for for the Citizen Science uh, Project? Now, you mentioned um, people and families uh, who have, have lung cancer or a loved one and caregivers. Uh, could you be a little more specific? And so, listeners, 
if they are either eligible or know people that are eligible, could refer them to this? Yeah, it's wide open. So it doesn't matter whether you you could have been diagnosed with an early stage lung cancer, had surgery a couple of years ago and still joined the study. Um, it doesn't matter what type of lung cancer it is. If you do know you have one of these oncogene, it doesn't matter. It's any type of lung cancer. Um, any uh, body a over the age of 21 can participate. Um, and uh, on the family and friends side, we're not just looking, sometimes people hear the word caregiver and they think, oh, well, I'm not, you know, really in the home doing a lot of sort of nurse-like activities. But when we say that, what we mean is you could be taking um, your friend or family member to their medical appointments and sitting in on those medical appointments and helping them make decisions on what they should do. So that can be one thing of caregiving or helping with managing insurance and some of the finances that come with a cancer diagnosis. So it's also wide open to family and friends um, who are participating in the care across all those kinds of activities um, for someone living with lung cancer. And if people are listening and know somebody who would be might be interested in completing the study, we would love for you to share it too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. All right. Thanks. It's such, a, such important work. Thanks for, for, uh, for doing this. Well, thanks for having us to talk about it. It's good. Happy to get the word out. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bob. While our first two guests work on specific illnesses, our next guest is trying to improve medical research writ large. All of the biggest biomedical research studies have relied on just a sliver of our population, often college graduate students and other people living near major research universities. Kirsten Crowhurst is Program Innovation Strategist for the All of Us program, which is trying to attract one million participants to help with biomedical research. Hey, Kirsten, thanks for speaking with us today. Hi, thanks, Bob. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, could you... Um, I, I'm really excited about all of us, and partly part of the reason is I've been reporting for so many years about, um, you know, how we don't really know about, you know, health and the human body and medicine uh, in any accurate way because the people that participate in all the various volunteer programs and and studies uh, tend to be of a type, and we don't have a good representation, and so I was really excited to hear about all of us. So can you tell us how you're, how you're sort of helping to solve this problem? Yeah, so that's right. So I am with the NNLM All of Us Program Center, which is a partnership between the network of the National Library of Medicine and the National Institute of Health's All of Us Research Program. Uh, who they are trying to get 1 million or more participants into this research program in order to expand um, the representation, just what you mentioned, uh, in biomedical research. Um, specifically, they're looking to engage people who have not been uh, involved in or represented in biomedical research. And so uh, our network looks to partner with um, libraries and other community engagement groups um, in order to get the word out about the All of Us Research Program. Right. And what's the library connection? Why do you uh, work with them? Yeah. So um, libraries are third places, which is places outside of the work and home. Um, where people gather and feel comfortable. Libraries are trusted by their communities um, and they have high access to their communities um, and so they know what their communities are interested in and what their needs are. Um, library staff are particularly adept at working within their communities to understand and actively participate and to invite community members to learn more about things that they're interested in or that the library is hosting. Oh, okay. Now, how does that connect with the idea of getting people more involved in the actual research? Because I could see how the librarians could, you know, point them to resources and things like that. But how does it, how, what's the next step? Yeah, so uh, 
libraries offer a wide range of health related resources like technology and internet access mm -hmm. um, they also host events and health screenings and other programs um, and so we see the connection in how libraries are connected to their community and how communities and people in general are interested in their health um, and personalized medicine um, so all of us can offer programs to libraries to offer their health expertise and opportunities to expand health programming and services in libraries. Oh, now if there are any librarians or people who know librarians that are watching, um, is there a way for them to get involved? Yeah, absolutely. Um, on our website, we have uh, an email address. So our website is all of us uh -huh. dot gov. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have any questions or you would like to engage with us, you can email NAPC engage at uiowa.edu. Okay. All right. And then what are the yeah, we offer? Oh, yeah, okay. I was going to say, yeah, yeah, we offer um, we do offer event support awards. Um, so if your library is looking to engage in health programming and would like um, an uh, a health programming um, speaker or would like to partner with all of us in order to provide health programming to your library, um, we do offer event support awards for that. Um, and that's very exciting. So um, they uh can go from up to five thousand dollars um for a library who's looking to uh provide uh health related information to their communities great and is that, um, is that nationwide offer, oh i'm sorry yeah it is it is nationwide yep um we also offer resources on health information um and we also take uh, um ideas from public library uh, staff uh, if they're interested in developing any training or programming um, for their staff or their communities so we're happy to take any ideas that um, libraries may have related to health programming that they see missing in their communities or that they'd like to um, increase awareness of Wow so this is really a two-way thing so you're not only trying to get folks to participate um, as far as you know being in in the studies but also you're providing information out to the community as well that's right exactly yeah um, and that's how we feel participatory research should be mm -hmm. so we're not just taking from the community we're not just taking your information we are hopefully providing something back to you that's valuable um, and that's another uh, core tenant of the all of us research program as well huh and i would expect that in the same way that medical research, biomedical research tends to skew towards certain communities, you know, college students, college towns, things like that, that you would probably try, be trying to get libraries in a wider range of communities, communities outside the usual yeah. Um, places, yeah, right? absolutely. Um, we love partnering with small rural libraries. We know that the, we know that some of the bigger libraries, um, may not be interested in the amount of funding that we're offering um, but mm -hmm. we know that our money can go a long way for small and rural libraries and we again are are hoping to expand uh, what medical and biomedical research currently looks like because it is very skewed um, and we're looking to expand that so we're super excited to partner with communities who you know may want to get involved with research but don't have a research hub in their communities right right now how 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 do people participate what what do they do yeah so if you want to join the all of us research program the most the easiest way to do that is to go to join all of us dot org slash nlm um, and it will tell you all the information about joining all of us and you can even sign up on that website. So if you're interested, um, you can sign up on that website. Um, otherwise, we do have events that are um, probably happening in your community. They're happening nationwide. Um, and uh, our office is really happy to connect you um, with any of those events. We can um, take a look on our calendar and see what's going on in an area near you 
you um, and we'd be happy to check that out as well okay and are they like filling out a survey are they what are they what are they doing to be part of this yeah so if you sign up on the website um, they will ask you to provide some background on your health information um, you'll sign up on their site and then um, if you sign up in person they will ask you to provide a blood or saliva sample um, depending on which site you're signing up at so that they can get some more tailored genetic information um, that they will return to you. So it is very exciting um, because oh. fully enrolled participants do um, who have shared their information with all of us do get um, the data directly back to them. Oh, okay. Yeah, so what sorts of uh, information do they get back from these? Great, yeah, so um, one of the benefits of participating in the All of Us Research Program is receiving your data information for free if you're interested. Um, the information that you can receive from providing the data to all of us is your genetic ancestry, so where your family might have lived um, hundreds yeah. of years ago, your genetic traits, so um, mm -hmm. Whether you may have an increased risk of developing a serious health condition, such as certain cancers or heart disease, and even how your body might react to certain medicine. Oh, cool. So it sort of overlaps with um, Ancestry.com, I guess, and 23andMe, um, but it's free. Uh, now, I read that you guys are also involved with um, Citizen Science Month, which is in April. So um, could you tell me a little bit about how you're connected with that? Yeah, we are. So um, the our office, the National Network of Library, mm -hmm. I'm just National Network of Libraries of Medicine, all of us, Program Center, NAPC. Uh -huh. um, our goal is to build and maintain partnerships with organizations and build capacity to improve the public's knowledge, skills, and access to resources. And so okay. we believe that Citizen Science Month and participatory science uh, is, a, is a gateway into becoming more involved in uh -huh. research in general. And so um, participating in citizen science programming and participating particularly citizen science programming that uh, engages you in health, environmental health, um, mm -hmm. and community health resources, um, mm -hmm. and learning that there really is no barrier to, uh, to learning more about health in your community and to supporting research programs that are going to be really impactful in your community. Um, so that's how we believe that citizen science um, can really open the door to people who might be a little bit hesitant when it comes to biomedical research and medical research in general, um, mm -hmm. but who will still want to help uh, researchers and make a difference in their communities. Great. All right. Thanks so much, Kirsten. Thanks, Bob. I really appreciate it. Sure. Now, you could sign up for Outbreaks Near Me, Longevity, and all of us at their respective websites. Or you could just log into your account at SciStarter.org and join them from there. Wait, you don't have an account at SciStarter? Well, why not create one right now? Not only will you have one-stop access to these and thousands of other citizen science projects, but you'll keep track of your activity on your dashboard and can even get our newsletter. All right, that's all we have for you this time. I'm Bob Hershon. Thanks for listening. This podcast is brought to you each month by SciStarter, where you will find thousands of citizen science projects, events, and tools. It's all at SciStarter.org. That's S-C-I-S-T-A-R-T-E-R dot org, O-R-G. If you have any ideas you want to share with us or any things you want to hear on this podcast or just compliments for my hairstylist, just get in touch with us at info at SciStarter.org. Once again, our email is info at SciStarter.org. Thanks.